yeah, I will I will hop hop in and do a quick intro. Uh, so welcome to the IPFS local and offline special interest group, group of people that periodically get together and talk about IPFS and related technologies in the context of offline and local first application development. Uh, we've had everything from data oriented uh, problems, uh, challenges that we might be able to use these technologies for, sometimes demonstrations. And today we would like to welcome Fishin, uh, Boris and Brooklyn, who will be talking to us about their work in developing um, uh, the uh, web native file system and a set of technologies that allow people to get onto the decentralized web, but using very familiar uh, centralized technologies, metaphors, and tools. So without further ado, welcome. Show us what you got. Awesome, thank you. Uh, and yeah, uh, James and Stephen uh, are also here. Uh, Stephen has done a lot of the heavy lifting uh, on this and, and uh, I think I'll do a demo of an app as well. Um, I will go ahead, I have some slides, so I will use those to go through. Can everyone give me a thumbs up if they can see this? Perfect. Um, so local first apps on IPFS with Fission. Um, that's kind of our default state that we wanna aim for. Um, so first of all, uh, what is Fission? So we talk about it as next generation app publishing. So right now the stack of technologies that you have to learn, not just to build an app, but then to host it and deploy it and scale it uh, is kind of a lot. So for us, we're thinking of this as designed for front-end developers. So you don't have to become a full stack developer or DevOps expert. Um, the main uh, open source SDK that we create, we call web native. Uh, right now it has user accounts, file and data storage, uh, and more that you can just add to your app. So uh, we lean into IPFS pretty heavily for that. Um, in the way that we've created an account system, data is actually stored with user accounts. So your, your app is published and the app asks permission of the user and each user uh, has their own file system um, where data is written into. Uh, and it's a little bit like an open source iCloud. So web native apps actually run client side, including on mobile and can work offline. Uh, I say can because you're still gonna have to do work to set it up that way and work with local storage and, and so on. Um, the publishing platform that does hosting um, has a command line interface, web-based app creation, um, DNS, SSL, all, all the good stuff that's expected today. Uh, and underneath, we publish everything to IPFS and automate DNS link. Um, and uh, uh, I'll go into that in a little more detail. Uh, feel free to stop me and ask questions along the way as well. Uh, so a uh, recent slide from uh, uh, Brooke. So we really think that you can build entire apps at the edge um, and they can be offline first and local, um, which means not having to learn servers, data store, DevOps pieces. So instead we put those things into the front end, into the client side. Um, so just in JavaScript, uh, anything that compiled down to JavaScript uh, can work with our SDK. Uh, so obviously interesting things in the direction of stuff like WebAssembly as well. Um, that's the one with the slight transition. Um, the way that we think about it is that we set ourselves the goal that this stuff should work in any browser, including mobile without plugins. So we lean pretty heavily into um, modern browser APIs. Uh, specifically, we target things that work on all major browsers, including mobile. Um, and that's kind of our line in the sand. Uh, if something only works on one browser, doesn't really help us. So that's what we're, we're targeting. Um, the web crypto API is a key piece where we in fact link your identity uh, with a private key held by your browser, web workers, service workers, IndexedDB, PWA and web app manifest. So for that, we really think that every app on Fission um, powered by web native should, it's an app and in, in, in fact should use some of this modern tech uh, should be configured as a PWA, should be added to a home screen, uh, should be, be able to have its own separate icon uh, if, you're, if you're on uh, on desktop. 
um, um, and you should set it up so that the, the parts of your app that make sense uh, do in fact work offline. Um, this is the rather tall stack that we're built on. Um, so we've designed what we've put together with a few concepts in mind. Uh, one of it is things that need to be portable. Uh, they're not just locked into fission. Uh, they can be used by anyone. Um, and that means starting with things like content addressing that we get from IPFS. Um, on the identity side, um, we've built our account system um, on top of DIDs. So private keys in the system represent your account. Um, Brooke has developed uh, a protocol called UCAN that lets you do decentralized authentication, including offline authentication, um, as sort of a decentralized version of OAuth. Uh, if you take the servers out and you make accounts owned by users, then you have to change how this stuff works. Um, we also put a stuff, bunch of stuff in DNS. Um, IPNS is not something that's reliable enough today for a variety of reasons. Um, and uh, uh, DNS ends up becoming a cache and we use DNS link uh, obviously to also work with uh, the rest of the web by running IPFS gateways. So people can visit a Fission app um, and it, they will visit it over HTTPS um, and then web native loads JS IPFS. Uh, and from then on the app uh, actually communicates directly and natively over IPFS. Um, the web native file system, which uh, Dietrich mentioned off the top, that's another uh, something that uh, Brooke has architected and uh, developed. Uh, we're basically uh, developing an encrypted file system. Uh, it obscures metadata, is performant, um, and designed to, to kind of uh, hold all the user's data and hold permissions for which apps can read and write into it. So any any browser device that you link in, you can then access your file system um, and it's just there and it continues to be end-to-end -end encrypted. So Fission helps um, sync and store this data uh, natively over IPFS, um, but it's the encrypted portions are encrypted. Um, we don't have the key. Um, and uh, of course, because all of these things uh, are represented by IPFS hashes, uh, the user can, of course, back up or store or pin or locally cache um, the file system as well. Um, the root of the file system, we keep an updated um, DNS link uh, up to date. Uh, so that's what we use right now when you're connecting from different devices to see what the, what the current snapshot of the root is. Not all of this stuff is uh, uh, built. So plans to add more database features, um, more things for um, real time and uh, um, uh, collaboration, which I'll have another slide to talk about a little bit that's more like future directions. Um, for this group, uh, I don't think I've actually shown this um, diagram uh, publicly yet. I just created it the other day. Um, so what Fission actually runs is relatively slim. Um, so we run um, an IPFS storage server um, and we run, um, we run things on Amazon. Um, we've uh, released some open source around uh, spinning up uh, IPFS nodes distributed around the world using Terraform. Um, we use the S3 plugin um, so we make sure things are, are backed up and available for everyone. And uh, we then, with web apps using web native, uh, they connect natively over secure web sockets uh, to be able to read and write over there. So they, they connect to the, the Fission bootstrap servers. Uh, so there's a path to the rest of the IPFS network from, from there. Uh, then our web API server is kind of the main thing and that's where we automate DNS. Uh, we store some unique usernames for accounts. 
Um, and then we have the Fission CLI that developers use day to day to doing development, to do publishing, to register new accounts and to register new apps. Um, and that web app in the picture is any arbitrary app that people publish that includes the web native uh, SDK. So it's uh, talking uh, over WebSockets with JSIPFS. Um, it's being served up by the gateway that we run um, uh, when people first visit it. Um, and we have, I don't know what the latest is, over, over 1,200 apps deployed on uh, uh, the main Fission service um, right now. Um, and yeah, just talking about, we use Haskell and Elm um, as, uh, as our main uh, internal languages. We've got um, examples in um, a number of different front end frameworks like React and Svelte. Um, Brian uh, on our team actually put together a WebAssembly example. We're pretty ex excited about WebAssembly for the future. Um, and then we've got integrations to a bunch of different uh, third party systems as well. Uh, specifically, the publish action on GitHub. So I personally run my blog on uh, Jekyll, a static site generator. Um, and uh, so I have a couple of different ways where whenever I make edits to the GitHub repo where my Jekyll site is, uh, it builds the site and then it auto publishes it to Fission, um, which underneath updates the DNS link. Um, so uh, everybody just visits over HTTPS um, uh, through the gateway. Uh, but in fact, uh, my, um, my site is all up on IPFS uh, as well. I'll pause there for a second. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, I have a very quick question. You mentioned um, using DNS, not only for DNS link, but also for cache. Um, not a cache per se, but basically saying um, we're, we're essentially publicly putting various things in DNS. So each user has their own file system in the web native file system. And so we need to keep track of the root. So we only keep track of root SIDs. Um, and so the root SID is uh, at a well-known location in DNS. So every user account has a DNS uh, subdomain and DNS link entry. Um, and every app uh, has a subdomain and a DNS link entry. Um, so you could do various things. I've been thinking about how uh, we could uh, build something for users where they could um, pin uh, apps and their own file system. And it would be simple to just look that up in DNS and make sure that you've got the latest hash that you're, that you're pinning um, with the nice properties that of course we get all of the files and blocks underneath. Cool. Awesome. You, you said 1200 apps applications built so far. Yeah. Lots of those it's, are going to be hello worlds and other stuff like that. Yeah. But we're pretty, we're pretty happy with, uh, uh, with a number That's of amazing. folks. Yeah, it takes I was curious if, if there are any patterns, like uh, particular applications that you thought like were good fits or that developers get feedback saying that it was good fit. Yeah, um, so uh, there's even actually apps that aren't published on Fission. So you can use the web native SDK and put your static site anywhere. Um, uh, so that doesn't even count all of them. Uh, the main thing that people have said is that, oh, wow, it was 80 lines of code to add a user account system and persistence and file storage and data storage, that was really smooth. That was really easy. Um, so we're going to get a lot of people who ideally are in the front end. And instead of having to pick like step one being learning how to become a full stack developer, what we're seeing is like, oh, it in fact was easy to add these interactive full app abilities to it. That's the consistency. on, And I'd say the other side is that people are very interested in uh, use our own data. Um, so Rosano is someone who had been working with uh, remote storage, um, which is uh, an IETF standard um, that uses OAuth. And uh, he went back and added Fission support to all of his apps as well. Uh, so people can log in with either remote storage or with a Fission account. And in both cases, the data remains owned by the, by the user. Um, encryption. Uh, of user data is the other common theme that people are very interested in. So we've had some early discussions with folks in things like healthcare, um, 
uh, Brooke and I had an interesting call with someone who was working on um, some women's health issues uh, and, you know, around menopause. And uh, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that you really want user owned and encrypted and not as a developer have to make sure that you protect. And uh, just to jump in really quick, one of the really nice things is since you have end-to-end uh, -end encryption and encryption at rest <clears throat> is your data can be stored literally anywhere uh, and replicated and it's fine, right? Uh, assuming that uh, there are, you know, the, the encryption works, right? So sometimes people have concerns about like, well, you know, when will people break AES-256? It's like, well, currently the US government is using that for, you know, really, you know, intense stuff. So probably not for a while, but, um, uh, suddenly the location independence of content addressing really just, um, you can just use it for so many more things. So, and there's a special interest group only for that. So <laughs> maybe, maybe wrong. Yeah. Brooke was on the IPFS IPLD security call. So that was great. Um, Fission Drive. Uh, so this is our first party app that we built um as a default uh browser that that users can actually inspect and look at their entire file system um because each app actually stores data um in the user file system uh the user can in fact browse to that data look at it inspect it and so on um so think of this as maybe your library folder or your documents folder in uh, uh in your operating system where apps put stuff uh, increasingly desktop and mobile advertise, um, mobile operating systems ask for permissions for things. And that's the same pattern that Fission is following. So I've shown here a screenshot of you actually have to give Drive itself access. So we can't cheat uh, because it's all cryptography um, where Fission can't say like, oh, well, let's give Fission Drive special permission. Uh, we can't do that. It's up to the user. Um, so I've showed this. Um, I can show it in as a demo as well. Uh, it does work offline. Uh, Steven, who's the author, the primary lead author on the uh, on this app, and a lot of the um, web native API is, is on the call. Um, so it mix and matches with um, local storage and IndexedDB uh, to store things and then sync again when it's online. Um, work in progress, uh, always hard to do across browser and mobile and, and all that good stuff. And our good friend iOS is always a bit cranky about various things. Um, but uh, that's our intent is, is that we put all this stuff together in a way that uh, developers don't have to figure this out from scratch. It should be all part of the SDK um, and, uh, and take care of, of syncing when you're on or offline um, um, and just put that all together for you. Uh, shall I do a quick uh, demo of Drive? Yeah, let's see yes, it. Yes, why not? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I can't go offline because then my my zoom would drop. <laughs> I can't prove it to you. Hi, there's the rub. Yeah, I've been in this position before. <laughs> so I'll just show this that I have up here already. Um, this is my great. Uh, it'll be very snappy because uh, everything's cached now and and so on. Uh, I can click through to these various things. Uh, the apps folder, I've linked it to an app called TiddlyWiki. Um, uh, and it's got a little index file in here. Um, it, all of this stuff, the default view is that we users should be uh, secure in knowing that their stuff is private by default. So you specifically have to go into the public folder and put things in the public folder. Um, so I can browse in the screenshots. Um, these are literally the screenshots from my presentation uh, that I am uh, storing in here. Uh, this is a screenshot of Foxy, um, our marketing lead, uh, Courtney's dog that I, I captured yesterday for the first time. Um, here's the other classic thing, capturing an error that I then have to add as part of a, uh, a bug report. Um, we do have a basic um, editor, text editor in here as well. Uh, so uh, this is loading up. This is an HTML file where you know we're hiding the um, uh, the file extensions here to make it look a little prettier. Um, we have previewers for different things. So you can see here that this is the source. Um, I can right click and I can get a link to file. I can copy the SID as well, but I'll go ahead and link to file. 
um, and then I'll open a new tab and I'll paste it in. Um, and it's red. Um, okay, cool. So I'm going to go in here um, and say not red, no red, not red, and green. Uh, and I will hit save uh, and close. Uh, and I will right click again. So underneath it should give me a link to a new file uh, that I will paste in. And this is not red. So I've just done a live edit. It's pushed it to IPFS. I get the link to it. Uh, obviously the other file still exists and is still red because we've got this unique hash in the middle. Um, and I can also get the direct SID um, let's see if it's made it over here and it's on the main IPFS gateway as well, obviously, right? Super simple, small file. Um, let's go for something a little bigger. Uh, I do already have this open in a tab. Let's copy the SID this time. Actually, this might be an IPFS as well. Um, And so this is the slides from today's presentations are uploaded. Uh, you can see it's loading to the main IPFS gateway uh, as well. Um, so all of this stuff is using regular IPFS, but in a way that is very browsable, um, very user friendly. Um, I'll give you one more example because I've already done permissions on this. So I'll go to the quotes app. Um, and this is a very simple app. It's all private to the user and I'll sign in. Uh, what it's going to do is it's going to say, um, you know, can I, as the quotes app, write to an application folder? Um, and if you want to use a Fission app, you have to give access to at least the application folder because uh, it needs a place to put its files because it doesn't have its own dedicated storage today. So I say yes, it shows who I'm logged in as here. Uh, it'll redirect me back to the app. It's empty. I'll do one of Brooks quotes, uh, because math, I'll do another quote that is uh, email is where knowledge oops, goes to die. That was said by Bill French way back in the day. Um, so just a little like personal quotes thing. Um, and then what I can do uh, is I can go back up here uh, and I may need to do a hard refresh. We don't have like live updating or anything that's pushing live changes right now. So um, that'll, that'll be coming. Yeah, so this is not, not live in here right now. If I hit a hard refresh, I'll go ahead and do that now. You can see that this other app folder is now available in quotes. Uh, and I've got this just little JSON file and that's where the app keeps data. Bill French. Brooklyn Zelenka, Fission works today for building apps like this. Uh, you don't need anything more complicated because you're not running a giant multi-tenant database. Uh, you're just running it on a per user basis. So front-end developers can essentially, if you're, doing, if you're doing React or Vue or Svelte, very often they will mock their data uh, for, for uh, writing locally. With Fission, you can essentially uh, ship your mocks, right? Uh, and you built a full app with user accounts uh, where the storage is stored for the user. Uh, and obviously this opens up uh, the ability to share data between apps as well, uh, which is something else that we're, we're pretty excited about. Um, before I click out of, out of uh, Fission Drive, uh, any other questions about Fission Drive? Uh, not about, about Fission Drive. But um, like uh, related kind of thing. Do, do you run your own gateway or? Uh, we do, yes. Yeah. Um, okay. The main reason we run our own gateway is because we have to run uh, um, secure WebSockets so yeah. that JS IPFS can connect to it. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a lot of discussions on, on what's next and I actually have a slide around that. So I'll, I'll actually go back to that.
So just talking through how the CLI works, um, I think this is very interesting. I believe that we are the only CLI tool um, that is natively uses IPFS. Uh, and this is what I mean by that. Uh, so uh, we are actually downloading and installing our own IPFS node. So our target market is not necessarily people that are deep into the decentralized web, but our target market is everyone. So a front end developer should be able to get all of these features without even having to know that IPFS is involved. It's just they inherit all of the awesome capabilities that, uh, that we get for building on top of it. Um, so you run Fission Setup. Um, we have support for Linux and Mac OS. Uh, right now we're recommending that uh, Windows users use WSL2 uh, to do that. Uh, we'll circle back around for any of Windows support at some point. Um, Fission app register, you can create a new app with subdomain. Um, we'll, uh, we'll generate a cute subdomain name for you. Uh, and then Fission app publish. Um, this actually publishes the app natively over APFS. So most other systems that we've seen uh, will actually publish over an HTTP call and then turn it into IPFS on the server side. Um, so what we actually do is we run a local node, we add to IPFS locally, uh, and then we contact the Fission server to register the hash and update DNS link. Uh, and the Fission server reaches back to the uh, uh, developer's local device uh, and just fetches um, over, over IPFS. Um, this ends up being pretty snappy and fast, obviously, for, uh, uh, um, you know, and faster, in fact, than things like um, doing a Git push. Um, and uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's, it's working very well. It's in production, lots of people using it, and we're pretty happy with it. There's a few other flags so you can run. Um, we turn off the node right now um, when, uh, when the publish succeeds. Uh, you can also give it a watch flag. And as you do edits, it'll just live update your, uh, your files and the DNS link root um, in the background. Um, so that's a pretty neat thing. I could have done that and just refreshed a page and showed you that as I was making edits, it was it was live and available everywhere at a, at a DNS address. Um, we do that because uh, laptops, um, power usage, bandwidth usage, and a bunch of other things like that. Um, we may do some options to do a long running version of that, but that's really what the next slide is about. So you've got everything running locally. You've got a hash published. Uh, it's actually available in your local node. So if you're running Fission Watch, uh, theoretically, you should be able to just run that directly locally offline in your, in your browser. That's, but that's the published version. It's the same as the, there's no difference. Um, we bootstrap to the Fission servers. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I may pronounce your name wrong. Uh, Marcin, is that how you pronounce your first name? Yes, you pronounce it Lidl. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, I, I like to ask before people using the link name. Lidl it is. So uh, Lidl has, uh, has this issue already. We've looked at some of these things. Um, Steven has written this up. Um, I'll share the link afterwards as well in our forum of a couple of different ideas of how to make this work. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we would love this to work more reliably um, it's ridiculous that we can run a node locally, but then can't really connect to it. Um, um, and so here's a, here's a couple of different ideas of, of, of stuff that we might need to do. Um, and enabled by default is always the huge thing, right? If we don't get to enable by default in IPFS in various things, um, then very few people will discover it, right? Comments, Lytle or Steven? I'd say uh, listening on WebSockets on localhost, it's doable because you don't need a TLS cert, uh, a localhost is a secure context. And we should be able to enable that by default in IPFS desktop and Brave, even before GoIPFS decides to do that. In GoIPFS, doing that by default may make less sense because uh, it's usually run on the like server in on yeah. the server context. Uh, but there are like some we have some ideas how to like automate uh, the TLS cert 
we have, uh, I don't want to go into that rabbit hole, but uh, we have this mechanism called Autonat, where node is able to tell, is it like diable from the public uh, network? And then, and only then we could do some automation, but that's like very early stages of like design. So I don't want to spoil it, uh, but we are looking at that. I'd say it will land in desktop and Brave probably before that. So that's a good news. Great. Yeah. Um, we'd love to, uh, you know, help test that and we could do various things with the CLI publish messages to, you know, right now we basically tell people just to go to the internet, which then fetches it off our servers, even though it's literally already sitting on their machine. Right. <laughs> It should do kind of both, like be fast uh, locally, but then exactly, we'll, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, why not both? Good. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, so this is a little like all over the place. Um, this is probably much this not probably this is much more Brooks domain uh, and uh, and James and Stevens domain. Um, so. We, you can, we have well-known usernames and from well-known usernames, you can read from each other's public folder locations today. Um, so that's a method to kind of do stuff that's, that's somewhat collaborative. Um, we do plan on having, um, you know, a shared permission and group structure. Um, so uh, permissions and encryption are key, ha ha ha. Um, and uh, we're going to do stuff with that to, to, to uh, give that capability to, uh, to developers building apps. Um, definitely, as you saw, I had to hard refresh. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges is, in fact, that like caching local storage, do I have the newest version of this app even, uh, never mind the data inside of it. So we've already thought about things like, oh, we should probably do a server side check. And if there's a newer app, then we give one of those little banners that says, do you want to reload? And you see that in, uh, I use an email app called Missive. You see it in Rome Research that have this like, hey, you've got a new version, you should refresh. Um, and then the other thing is um, uh, something like PubSub. Uh, we use it for device linking today. Uh, Matrix is a really interesting protocol. Um, and um, Brooke, do you want to maybe talk about how you're thinking about either that or some of the collaborative stuff? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we used to use IPFS PubSub, but it was not super reliable. It looked like, actually browser to browser was pretty much fine. Uh, we had to run our own WebRTC, WebRTC star um, server. But aside from that, which would be nice if, I know that down the road, there's plans to make this just automatically connect, but um, it didn't bridge well between uh, the browser and Go IPFS um, if we wanted to, to link stuff through the CLI. Uh, so we threw that out and just wrote a, a simple uh, WebSocket relay. Um, Matrix, super interesting. Um, uh, and uh, because over time, we're going to want to use this for more things than just, <clears throat> you know, sending some, you know, lightweight credential information, right? Having real-time editing, real-time collaboration, all of that um, uh, useful. And then obviously people want chat as well. So matrix is a nice fit for all of these things. <clears throat> um, today we boot up, uh, bootstrap up a, um, uh, a secure session on top of the web sockets. We also used to do this on top of uh, PubSub where we do what looks, it's not exactly the same, but similar to like a TLS handshake, uh, do key exchange with a session key uh, and then can securely pass uh, information back and forth. Um, yeah, so that, that's the real-time stuff. There's also, because um, uh, Boris mentioned, you know, getting the latest update on an app, uh, pushing the top SID of uh, file assistance apps, et cetera, uh, over PubSub so that each peer is now broadcasting, hey, I, I did an update, or hey, I published this and um, the uh, HTTP gateway accepted it. Here's the signature. You should all synchronize with this version now. Um, something that we're uh, calling the, and from you know several slides ago, it's in that stack, um, uh, an ephemeral store so that we can do really quick updates. Um, and then um, 
uh, and things like you know per character changes um and then persist it at some you know known interval or when things are in a good state or 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 whatever so that that's more um uh it's a little bit more of a flexible um uh store rather than our actual persisted file system <clears throat> um which also has some extra stuff in there too it's uh, uh non-destructive and, and whatnot so we have to keep a bunch of links for each change so we want those to be uh to be larger um collaborative editing um, yeah, we looked at auto merge, YJS, uh, a, a bunch of CRDT based systems. <clears throat> um, they pretty much work, uh, especially for um, real time collaboration, which is great. But for longer documents and, and longer term uh, data, they they fit less well. Or for large data sets, they they fit less well. Um, so uh, have been thinking about, uh, and, and actually uh, the, the main guy um, behind Auto Merge has also um, uh, done a little bit of work in this direction too. Uh, different uh, model, um, CRDT for collaborative editing and then large scale um, uh, uh, aggregation of data. So pushing over essentially gossip sub, uh, gossip pub, sorry. Um, uh, information in a CRDT that's just purely set based and based on data log. Um, and then uh, we can get all kinds of nice properties like much, much, much better performance, uh, only syncing um, subsets of data, being able to put data together, pull it back apart. It's Byzantine fault tolerant. Like there's, there's a bunch of stuff like that that falls out of this. Um, and doesn't matter if it's going through the internet or on a local device, sharing between multiple apps. Um, we don't make uh, the actual underlying technology doesn't make a distinction between different apps, which all have their own keys and their own identity and a human being who has their own sort of top level key. So it's the same um, uh, system to collaborate between separate apps with the same user logged in with some subset of rights as it is to collaborate between people. <clears throat> um, so having that be able to be uh, this substrate for uh, real time and uh, data set sharing and doing uh, databases where parts of the data are available to one um, uh, one participant, but not another, right? And having everything still work, um, uh, which is also related to this, this database uh, idea. Um, Project Cambria data schema merging, uh, we have some thoughts on uh, doing shared schemas between applications as well, uh, and how to translate between them. Um, since everything's data log based in the, the current model, we still have to do a little bit more uh, R&D uh, around this. Um, it's fundamentally schema list. So there's Cam Cambria lets you take uh, schema A and schema B and translate between the two. And it's potentially lossy, like you, you may lose information or have some defaults put in if you're going one direction or another. Um, the schema list layer, there's this extra step of you've got to take from the this, somebody recently described it as this just loose soup and bring it up into some structured data. Um, and so typically we should be able to skip the um, translation from schema to schema, um, but we may still need to have some default fields and whatnot. So it ends up looking a lot like Cambria or if an application expects expects things in a certain format and needs to deliver it to say a uh, traditional you know rest based api it can then translate that and and send it across so and specifically for uh offline apps um this is uh the the simplified version that my tiny brain understands about uh, project cambria is uh, and we have a video presentation about that that uh, that i can throw in the links as well um is basically that a version one app can collaborate with a version 1000 app. Uh, so not just drift over the data, but you have drift over the app itself. Um, and Project Cambria helps solve some of these things. Again, some of this is well known for building things like desktop apps or mobile apps that, that kind of do this. Um, so we're pretty excited about having this uh, as well. Um, we ended up going this direction of building this database uh, because we had done the initial work of, of designing the web native file system that handled private data and encryption. We then looked at other things like orbit DB um, and uh, it doesn't really have the concept of uh, encryption or private data. Um, and so we have been finding it easier to build on top of our system that is 
already solved privacy and permissions um, because that's the key point, not the data store layer. Um, there's other folks that are adopting some of our stuff. So the query team um, ha has looked at and implemented uh, Brooks UCAN uh, authentication design in, in, in Go. Um, and I know Carson at Textile is, uh, is tinkering around with it as well um, because you need something that looks like it in to solve a lot of these problems. Uh, Open specs, we have a white paper and a bunch of other stuff where we've documented it. Uh, we're happy to work at the R&D layer, at the protocol layer, as well as up at the app layer. Uh, happy to work with people on, on any of this stuff. Um, uh, final thing that I kind of wanted to say, and I think this is my last, I think this is my last slide. Um, the way that we think about Fission, all our stuff is open source. Um, so we run uh, a hosted service. Uh, so. That's, that's the fission part, the fission platform. Uh, we, you know, you currently get subdomains in the, in the namespace of fission.app. Users get fission.name. Um, I've been using this term constellation provider. Um, and we're focused on, on developers and users being able to just sign up and stuff works. Um, and we're getting good adoption and we uh, are looking to have more of that. Um, but uh, you, from that diagram that I showed earlier, like. You, you know, you, you need to know some DevOps. You need to, you do need to be a full stack developer, know a little DevOps to run this stuff at scale. Um, but you can run the Fission server yourself. We're having some early discussions um, with uh, companies and other organizations that are interested in further customizing what Fission does, having their own app names, um, because we've got this user identity and publishing and file system in a box. Um, that makes for a really, really strong set of capabilities already. Um, and what we'd want to do there is we want to federate. Um, so uh, Webfinger is probably the obvious thing there. Uh, Rosano, who I mentioned earlier, um, he and I did a little experiments because he's coming from the remote storage uh, world. Um, and uh, that's where we've gotten to so far is you'll enter in something that looks like an email address. So this is a common pattern across things like Matrix or Mastodon or other systems that um, uh, Matrix doesn't use Webfinger, Mastodon does, uh, but we think that's a pretty strong common pattern uh, across things. Um, and then, you know, uh, that's what we envision is we can have lots of this stuff uh, running um, and, uh, uh, and federate between all of these things. Um, and then you have more and more folks online uh, running things that are in this client side app mode uh, um, and more IPFS with strong links between them. It doesn't matter if an app uh, is published on Fission Server 2 or Fission Server 1. Um, it should all just work um, and be cached and pinned uh, transparently. And that's it for me. Other questions? That's great. It's. Uh... It's very useful stuff. Um, I think uh, there, there are so many applications actually. That how, how many did you mention there are? Uh, just over 1,200 right now. Okay, okay, great, yeah. Um, yeah, we, it, it needs, it needs time to, to go through all of that stuff. But, uh, yeah, there's, there, there, there's a lot here if you haven't seen it before. Um, yeah. uh, we've, been, we've been working on this for a while. Um, we essentially, with the GitHub Actions, we essentially have parity with um, Netlify at this point at the publishing layer. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, we can handle custom domains, uh, various other things like that. The new upcoming thing that I'm super excited about is um, non-developers being able to clone apps. Basically, we could do this because of the properties of uh, IPFS where uh, if you come to a page that is a fission powered app uh, and you're like, hmm, I'd like a copy of this. Uh, you can clone the app, we'll create a new subdomain for you and there you go. And we think that's a very interesting pattern um, for um, essentially non-developer users, designers, et cetera, to be able to get in and, and, and work with stuff. And we'll, we'll have some uh, uh, demos around that soon. Very interesting. I had a quick question about um, kind of platform portability. So uh, Fission services go down today. Uh, my application, does it still run? What do I have to do? Uh, all my data might be there. 
Do I have to manually set up some things to like sync application resources and assets uh, to my own repo or data store? How does that look like for I'm a business who's uh, betting on Vision as a hosting platform? Yeah, uh, great question. So um, the way we think about it right now, I mean, I think that's the that's the the next step. Uh, the the tricky point is DNS. <laughs> Um, which is the actual issue here, right? Um, so, uh, you know, we, we, we map, uh, we're just running C names for all of these things, which, which map to one IPFS gateway. Uh, I run my personal site, bmanconsulting.com, um, using the Cloudflare gateway, where um, uh, the current version of that, of that hash update will remain up and will remain available. Um, uh, right, so Cloudflare handles that layer. Um, so uh, the critical point becomes the gateway right now and the HTTP uh, uh, link to that. On your other question about data availability, um, what I would like to do, and we have some notes on this, is like what I said before, because uh, we, we'd like to give early adopter users, um, perhaps businesses as well, um, the ability to write a really simple script that just looks at the newest hash in DNS link and pin it to a Raspberry Pi. I'm looking over here because I just I just have my 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 Raspberry Pi set up now, uh, or something like that, or running it locally on your machine. Again, we're talking about local offline. By default, it should just be run and keep updated. And then the question becomes one of trust and where do you look for like truth of the like newest version and, and stuff like that. Brooke briefly mentioned things like uh, signing updates. We've got this proof chain um, because everybody's using a private key with the server. Um, so you, you, we, you, know, you could even verify on your own that in fact it was a certain identity that, uh, that did those things. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what it looks like right now, uh, Dietrich, is uh, uh, the nice thing is that this is, Fission makes this possible. You can't really do this at, with IPFS. Um, and, um, you know, is it cheating to shove stuff into DNS text uh, entries? It's, it's the most decentralized thing that we could come up with that we don't actually have to run ourselves, essentially. The distributed key value store. Come on. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. So more of the more of the thing that ends up becoming like, yeah, it, it, we we've reduced it as much as we can um, to these sorts of things. Um, you notice I don't really mention pinning a lot because I don't really believe in it. Um, I don't think it's something that should be exposed to users. What do users want? My stuff available and backed up. Right? Yeah, that, that actually might be worth uh, mentioning really briefly because you know a lot of pinning services spend time uh, managing pin sets for users, <clears throat> which we don't do. Everybody's, all of your stuff is in one DAG and then you update that. And the old one has a link back to the old one and a bunch of links in between to the new one, right? So it's only just that one top hash and we can just take that one in DNS. And if you want to replicate it, you just scrub that one and say, give me everything from it. Because we have a permission system, which isn't sitting in somebody's database as an API call that isn't under anyone's control. Uh, right. So um, again, we're leaning into the native properties of IPFS um, to, to really like, let's use the stuff that's built there. And things like versioning is built in. Developers can access versions. Um, we're, we actually have some issues where um, we can't use the native way of calculating um, file system sizes because essentially we have recursive loops where every time you add a new version, the entire file system, uh, it traverses the whole thing. And it's like, why do you have eight terabytes in here? <laughs> so, or, or uh, rather every, every time you add a link, cause it's obviously you can't have loops, right? Every time you add a link, it's calculating all of the history again uh, into the uh, size of the DAG because the uh, algorithm is just very simple. It's a uh, just tree, you know, aggregation 
apply to a DAG. So if you have multiple routes to the same file, you'll get that same file counted multiple times. Uh, we've looked at this a little bit and the best way we can figure it out is uh, we're gonna have to disassemble the DAG into a tree. Uh, so instead of having you know human readable file paths, just break it up by SID and then calculate that, uh, which is a bit of a pain. <laughs> Uh, but overall, um, you know, every release of Go IPFS uh, is more stable um, and has more features, and and that's been really well. Like very often, sometimes we've had issues where we're like, okay, we're just going to move to zero point six. You know, there there were very zero point four point X days where we're like, have we made the right decision? Um, <laughs> so you know, thank you to the protocol lab teams and so on for for keep doing that. I think the rest of it ends up just being, okay, what does it mean to run a constellation provider? Uh, we recently used um, IPFS cluster and then ripped it all out and essentially manage it ourselves. We still run IPFS clusters as in we run multiple instances and they're in Europe and they're in the US and, and so on, but we don't, uh, cluster is all about pin sets and it just, we're like, we can just tell it new SIDs. Um, so that's a report. And I know um, Brooke recently had a discussion with some other folks. And I think that's a discussion I had for other people who are um, helping to keep IPFS stuff online. Um, we probably need a operators working group to talk about that side of thing. Are you using PubSub or something like that? Or is totally out of band of IPFS altogether for that coordination between nodes? So we, uh, we, it's like, there, there, there isn't really a between nodes, it's our web server makes uh, async requests to every node in the cluster. And we wait for the first one to finish. So we get streaming updates um, with timeouts and stuff, you know, stuff like that. But uh, we wait for the first one to finish, report back to the user and then let the rest of them keep going. Uh, which I realize is a much simpler case than we're going to coordinate with CRTTs or RAF or you know one of these other things, but it's been like immediately reliable. It took maybe five hours to write. So, which in part is leaning into the native protocol in a in a very nice way, right? Like that's the thing. Like we get all this dedupe and all this other stuff like that. So um, you know, there's 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 this stuff like app cloning that we're going to put. People are like, how are you pulling that off? We're like, that it's it's actually mainly the protocol and we gave it a name and put stuff on top of it and give you a new subdomain, which isn't particularly hard, but is novel. Yeah, uh, that, is, that is one of the visceral mind blowing parts of people's like, beaker experience is they're like, hey, I just cloned a website and now I put my name on it. I like the design or the features in that one, one click. Now I have my own copy that I can run and modify and change and key in theme. Yeah. And we need to do this in a way that doesn't need a special browser, right? That's that's our line of sight. No extensions, no special browsers. Um, you know, if there are browser vendors like Brave or others who do interesting things, um, great. Um, that just should make the experience better. Yeah. Uh, in some ways, we're endeavoring to make IPFS boring. Mm. Mm. Eh? <laughs> Lionel was like, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, this is great. Like, thank you for inviting us. Um, I think, you know, like, just let us know how else we can help with this. Um, I think there's probably pieces here at the app layer. Um, I'd say one thing that I didn't flag um, is uh, as another item to kind of work on is um, a lot of apps that work offline PWAs end up being created as um, single page apps. Um, depending on the framework, um, they will end up using um, routing uh, that is not compatible with IPFS. Um, so we so far run a plain Jane IPFS gateway 
uh, in part for our commitment to portability. But uh, increasingly, it looks like we really should be running a proxy. Um, I know lots of other people run NG Nginx for reverse proxies already in front of this. Um, so there's kind of two paths. It's just more like a common understanding that it, just like you can drop an IPFS 404 file somewhere, is this something that we talk to Go IPFS? Do we just have a common pattern for the way you do proxies where you look for a config file and if it, you know, we're like to actually make IPFS work for hosting, you're gonna have to give some hints to the server uh, in some ways. Um, and that would be a huge quality of life experience um, for um, SPA developers where uh, they could just drop in a little file that says, please turn on clean routing. Um, also has impacts for SEO, huge impacts on SEO um, uh, for using hash routing because uh, it doesn't show up in various places. And other than that, what, what I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to remember 177, what's your, what, 177. I'll get, Lytle, I'll get t-shirts made when we, when we ship. <laughs> yeah, uh, I just uh, linked on the chat, but it's Zoom. So quick, quickly click that. <laughs> so it does not disappear when this meeting ends. Uh, regarding them, the, the, there's this idea that we should have uh, support for some sort of like a manifest, which could, uh, help website de developers uh, tweak the behavior when you expose UNIXFS directory through the gateway. And that's most likely happening this year because it's like long time due. Uh, and there, there's like a long list of things like supporting old links for the uh, search uh, optimization, uh, co customizing content types for various things like that, customizing security related HTTP headers, uh please drop a comment if you have like a something that's not mentioned there it will be very useful because we will uh block some time this year to uh create a proposal uh i'll make sure to include you in the loop but if you have like anything uh, not already written down please drop it there uh because that's like something we really need to do <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, uh, yeah and I, I agree uh specifically for like the routing comment uh, most of problems disappear if you use subdomain gateways. I mean, like most of problems yes. disappear when you like have, have like the content root becomes the root of the path of the URL. Yes. Um, and I'm afraid there's no better way that works yeah. in all browsers. And we will be moving root away. relative addressing. Yeah, yeah, totally. As so, soon as you uh, get that fucking IPFS in there, you're like, great, you just broke everything. Yeah, yeah. So the idea <laughs> is uh, that we will be slowly during this year uh, putting some pressure, soft and hard pressure, for people to migrate away from paths, which start with IPFS to subdomains. Mainly, we will be disabling things like cookies or some like more advanced APIs on those paths. And that way, people who really want to run uh, websites will be kind of like f slowly transitioning to secure uh, uh, subdomains or just subdomain. I'm not saying the, those subdomains with CIDs, but just like you said, you are giving the pet name subdomain uh, for user. And also it's great for uh, like kind of like an entry drug for uh, people to uh, take like uh, sell this like idea of self-identity. They may experiment with your own names, uh, fusion that app, but then if they have their own domain, just like Dietrich asked about what happens if they, your service goes away or someone wants to run uh, their own, they just like flip the DNS link on their own domain name uh, and they're self-hosting. Actually, the data will migrate itself to their own node. So I, I'm very supportive uh, towards that. Uh, please drop comment about the manifest because I personally want to see this sooner than later. Yeah. I had an interesting discussion with someone where I'd love to, I, I feel like I'm not sure what the play is for IPFS uh, at the protocol layer exactly, but uh, I think we should be pushing PWAs. I see a lot of people talking about like electron apps or like other things like that. And I understand why you might want to do that for control and node, but I also see those same people mainly being uh, developers who sit 
at desktops all the time. Um, and I continue to be really, really focused on, on this. Um, so one of the things that Fission would like to do is, is help people get their PWAs published to um, the Android Play Store um, and the Windows Store. Um, and uh, as part of that, so Manifest made me think about it. We're essentially, we're gonna have apps on Fission or we have already. Um, and we're just basically gonna, we're not gonna come up with a new format. We're gonna ask people to fill out their manifest file and you get an icon and you get a description and so on. So thinking about any extending, essentially vendor ex extensions to that manifest file may be something um, to be done, one. Uh, and two, I think, like I said, like if we can work together on templates, starter repos, et cetera, that like, you know, most front end stuff should just work with, with IPFS out of the box, right? But hey, let's make sure it works offline. Let's make sure it's a PWA. Um, and I think that, that there's huge areas of, of collaboration there. Hello. Just one quick comment. The best thing about Fission is that I, I can have any app, I, I can see all my data. It doesn't matter where it is hosted. It doesn't matter where it is. All your data is really accessible to, across any apps. I mean, that, that is just really significant that they, without any, any special effort. So I think that, that, that really is amazing. Okay. Thanks, Jerry. Uh, Jerry's an early adopter has been doing a ton of really, really interesting stuff by, by leaning into the, the vision capabilities. Great stuff. Yeah, this has been great. We're over, but it sounds like there's a lot of threads we may want to pick up here and keep chatting about. But I know we have your contact information for us. So if any of this team wants to chat more about specific proposals, I think we can do that. Um, I dropped a link in the chat to the issue where we have the announcements for this meeting. So if anybody wants to follow to see what we have for next month, we're hoping to get back on our monthly cadence. Dietrich, anything else to wrap up? Can you share an address for the slides? Oh, I, I, I will, I will, uh, okay, I will, cool. I will put, I will put a link in the, um, uh, in the GitHub thread. Issue. I will send Perfect. an ACID is what I will send. <laughs> address, <laughs> we'll cover them all. Amazing. Thanks, Thanks so everyone. Much for coming. Thank you all. Thanks everyone. Bye-bye.